Hey guys, Solomon here. Hope you're having a great day. As you may have seen in yesterday's video, I managed to beat a 2513 International Master with the Hippo as white. Now I'm playing as black against Master Carl. Right, my first game just finished. I'm now going up, uh, you know, against someone, you know, rated 2200, you know, kind of pulling up on 2300. And, uh, you know, very strong player. A lot of you guys might know him as Carl the Crusher on the on the Coffee Chest YouTube channel. Uh, you know, a good friend of mine. We've, we've played Blitz Chess multiple times. Recently, we played some Bug House. And, uh, yeah, great guy. And here we are, right, round two, uh, very shortly after my first game, right? I mean, I'm, I'm in the two-day schedule here, so we're just, we just have games back to back to back. And now as black, he starts the game off with D4. Well, y'all know me. I'm playing the hippo, right? I played the hippo to get the candidate master title. I'm, I'm now playing the hippo to try to get the master title, the national master title. I play G6, right? I go with my usual one, two, and three. And, uh, okay, I play the move E6 here, knight E7. I remember thinking to myself, gosh, just don't play F4, right? Don't play F4. You know, play a move like knight F3. This makes my game easy, right? I'm just going to, you know, develop into my usual hippo setup and, uh, you know, start looking at primarily F5 breaks, right? Whenever you see this pawn chain, I talk about this in my course, but whenever you see a pawn chain from E4 to C4, F5 is an eventual break that you really want to look at, right? Kind of just damaging, uh, you know, the outside, which is really the center of that pawn chain. On the flip side, if you see an F4, E4, D4 pawn chain, a move like C5 can be a good idea trying to break open uh, you know, and really just break up that center, attacking that d4 pawn. Well, guess what? In the game, he plays f4, right? And uh, I was I was kind of surprised. I was I was pretty comfortable here uh, as black. I think with all my preparation for making a course. In that course, I talk about what to do against the four pawn center. And you know, I mean, I think before that, I would have felt um, you know very uncomfortable in a position like this. But you know, since I put so much work in trying to figure out what to do with this, I, I felt pretty comfortable here. Of course, I think it is difficult. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this is what I love to play against. Right? There's other setups that I like more, but I still felt pretty good here. I just continue developing. Right? Fiend shot on my bishop. Bring my knight to d7. And okay, we now have the move queen d2. What is our approach against the four pawn center? Well, it's really a lot different than any other setup that we see against the hippo. Why is that? Against other setups. We have a ton of moves that we're thinking about, right? One of them is, is a6 and b5, right? Guess what? Against this setup, b5 is simply not an option. We're also thinking about h6 and g5. Well, guess what? We can't do that, right? We're looking at moves like f5 or c5. I would say against the four pawn center, it is not my recommendation uh, to play that. Uh, you know, I think a move like, like f5 here and there's just so much that white can do. White can keep the tension. Uh, they could push, right? They could just push and make your bishop seem miserable. Uh, there's a lot of things that they that they can do. And, uh, you know, really my favorite approach, what I recommend, is to use the knights against a four-pawn center, right? White, white has advanced those pawns. They have a ton of space. Surprisingly, we want them to keep pushing, right? They've pushed super far. Keep coming forward. There's going to start being cracks in the wall. Right. So in the game, I play the move of knight f6. But what made me come to this conclusion? OK, there's a couple of different things. OK, first off, we look at bishop placement. Right. Our, our knights don't just want to affect the pawns. We want to chase those bishops around. In this case, a move like knight f6, knight g4 is a spot that could kind of harass this bishop a little bit. Right. Knight c6, on the other hand. I mean, if we come to knight b4, I mean, what is what are, what are we doing? Right. That's one thing. The second thing is we got to ask ourselves which pawn in the center is the weakest, aka which one has the least defenders. In this case, if we look at the central pawns, meaning the pawns on the E and D files, the D pawn is defended three times. The E pawn only once by the knight on C3. So this is by far the weak pawn. I, I would also mention that, like in this case, knight C6, again, on top of the fact that this just, I mean, white could look at this and literally just sit there and go, okay, like what are you doing? On top of that, they could play the move of d5, and if we go back, remember, we want them to push, but in this case, they take the e-pawn, and now we, we sell a pawn on e6, but it has no defender, right? And the reason that this matters is because of a move like knight g5. Is a pawn on e6 or d6 easier to defend, right? This is one of those things I want to kind of bring up in this video. In general, is it easier to defend a pawn on e6 or d6 in the hippo? Or in general, right? Uh, technically speaking, the answer 
is d6, right? d6 is an easier pawn to defend. Why is that? Well, notice here, our pawn on e6, the queen can't defend it in this situation, right? Or at least it's not defending it currently, and, and right now it can't because there's two knights in the way. The king as well, we can't just defend this pawn because f7 is taken away. So we're going to be forced to play a move like knight c5 or even knight f8 defending that pawn on e6, right? In the game, instead of knight c6 allowing d5 and breaking up my e6 pawn, which is really going to become a big target that is very easy to attack, I play knight f6. Now, e5 didn't happen in the game, but notice if it did, right? And, and honestly, in this case, you could argue that a move like knight g4 is great, right? Just, just start harassing that bishop. Even if white does take on d6, notice now a move like knight b5, uh, guess what? It's already defended, right? And even if our knight was on d7 and it was attacked, we could just play knight f6. Notice a queen can defend d6 on its starting square, but it can't defend d e6 right so that's that's really my whole idea there so generally speaking when i see a four pawn center i'm much more inclined to think about knight f6 just because e5 is not super damaging to our pawn structure uh, whereas d5 and taking here that pawn is going to be hard to defend especially with a hippo structure so i play the move of knight f6 and and basically what i'm asking here i see a four pawn center i'm not i'm not scared of it in the sense of oh my gosh they have so much space i'm asking white to take more right? The second that you play e5, weaknesses start to form, including d5 and f5 not being defended so well, right? As you just saw, we're playing knight g4. Knight f5 is a move that we could consider in the future as well. So in the game, we see knight f6. Carl here, uh, he doesn't want to push his pawns, right? He has a very solid setup. He doesn't want to start forming cracks in the walls for my knights to start taking advantage of. So we see the move of queen over to c2, Right and at this point, I make a break with d5. Right, I'm putting some pressure on e4, and uh, both of my knights are, you know, supporting that d5 pawn. Uh, you could argue that I actually probably should have just castled. But right? this is another option that that we have available. But I play d5. I felt comfortable here. E5 is played. Usually in a hippo setup, I, I wouldn't like them having two central pawns versus my one. Right on the e and d files, but in this case, I have knight g4 attacking that bishop. And, uh, not, and the f5 score is available as well for one of my knights in the future. We now have bishop g1, and I play h5. Now, a lot of you may be wondering, why do you play h5? Well, the idea here is pretty similar to, to one of the variations that I recommend in the Karl Kahn against the advanced variation. We play h5 because against h3, which is probably going to be on the way, we play knight h6. Guys, g4 is not possible because our pawn is on h5. If our pawn was on h7 g4 could be played our knight here is going to be absolutely miserable right i mean if you play g4 now we just take it right but if you play g4 without a pawn on h5 we're completely stuck on top of that the very next move now if you play g4 we have a pawn that can take it right our knight's just not gonna have to run right back to where it came from we take it guess what we're winning a rook okay so that's exactly what happened in this game i played h5 brought my knight to h6 and brought it to f5 now putting some pressure on all of these very key dark scores, specifically the pawn on d4. We now see the move of bishop d3 from Carl. I continue with the move of a6. Knight d1 is played, and I play queen d7. It, it actually turns out that I could have played the move of c5, and I wasn't really aware of this idea and you know until I played this game out and really reviewed it afterwards. Um, I actually do play this idea later on in the game, but I actually could have played c5 followed by d4 right now, and I do play it later on. But it actually works right now. Now, did we just give up a pawn? We did, but we do get compensation for it and some benefits. Okay, first off, if you look at White's pawn structure, there's a lot of glaring issues here. Okay, the, the knight on f5 is extremely solid. Okay, this pawn on f4 can't move. The pawn on g2 technically can move, but the second you do, the knight on f3 is going to fall. Right, our, our active bishop here is doing a ton. And again, if you ever do play g4 we, we just take and we're just going to pick off your rook right so so white here is really going to have a hard time doing anything uh, on the king side of the board in terms of their pawn structure and there's a lot of squares that i could potentially seeing a knight jump into right i mean let's say here you know on, on top of all that we're, we're threatening to take on f3 and just absolutely obliterate white's pawn structure if white plays something like bishop e4 we can just throw in a little check right throw in a little check King over or something, we can throw another check. Rook c8 on the way with tempo against that queen. If the queen blocks, we can take it. Take on e4, rook c8, 
taken ownership of that file. Rook C2 is a big option on the way. And uh, White's up a pawn, but it's just going to be hard for them to, to really play out a position like this. Their knight is trapped by this pawn on d4 currently. Uh, you know, a move like knight d5 is, is definitely an option in the future, covering a ton of key squares. Bishop h6 is another move that I that I could potentially look at, although all that to say, you know, knight f6 could be a little bit problematic at some point. A position like this is very, it's very interesting because we're down a pawn, but we just have we just have superior piece placement and pawn placement, um, and there's a lot of things that White is going to kind of have to awkwardly work out, right? Kind of similar to the Banco Gambit. A lot of you are probably wondering, well, why did I just mention the Banco Gambit? It's way different. Well, yes, the Banco Gambit does give us a different position, but it ends up with the opponent being up a pawn, but they have a lot they got to work out, and our play seems a lot more natural, step by step, right? Not just trying to figure something out. So. Okay, all that to say, knight d1 was played. I could have played c5 right now, followed by d4, activating this bishop, you know, swinging this rook over to c8, getting some hyperdynamic chess in the game. I ended up just playing queen d7, uh, which I didn't think was a bad move. Knight e3 was played, by the way. That's the whole reason that Carl played this. He is trying to get rid of this very strong knight on f5, and he and he does here because I, I take that knight on e3. And I'll play bishop h6, just putting some pressure on that pawn by the way another benefit of having a pawn on h5 uh you know g4 g5 stuff like that if you play g4 we're just taking it we're just taking that pawn right so this pawn really does give us a huge space advantage on the king side and uh you know we're really preventing white from making any further progress rook c1 is played i play rook c8 b4 is seen and i now play c5 right notice here i give up a pawn i just give up a pawn but there's a lot of ideas that I had going in this game. And, and honestly, at this point, I'm playing off of intuition a lot. This is a 60 minute game with two second delay, right? So <clears throat> I can't, I, I can't calculate everything, but I'm going a lot off of intuition. What I did cal what I did calculate is, is some of these things. So first off in this position, what happens if Bishop takes? Well, I can't take the Bishop right away because the Knight defends, but, but I can't just take the Knight out, right? Take out the defender. I take the piece. I'm up a piece for two pawns. And this is some of the worst pawn structure I've ever seen. Okay, so, so, you know, going back, bishop takes d4, that just ain't going to work. That ain't going to do it. Okay, bishop f2, what about that? Well, now you just lost your pawn on, f, on f4, right? So I get my pawn back, and, and now we're only on the way up. We're taking on f3. We could take on e5, right? We just remove that defender. You could take on a6, but we have rook b8, and I, I do believe that, that black here has a superior position. Our king is going to get pretty safe. I'm, I'm not really sure where this king can get to, where it's going to feel secure. And, uh, okay, I mean, going back to d4, the one move I was a little bit concerned about was knight takes d4. My plan was to play knight d5. And this is kind of where intuition comes in, right? Intuition speaks about uh, not knowing everything that's going to happen, but just having a good feeling about a position, a good directional analysis, um, an understanding of, of things that can take place. Um, and, and you're really working more off of feeling more than more than just oh i have everything calculated and down to a t right and sometimes in chess you got to do that especially when the clock is at play i play 95 right and notice here what, what i'm really trying to do is i'm trying to attack the bishop and using two pieces to attack this pawn in the game uh of course carl doesn't play this we'll go over what he does but but okay i mean let's say a move like queen t2 I, I could just castle here keep the tension right what i saw is that i have two very active bishops if you ever play c6, I have one, two, you know, one, two, three pieces all on that square, so I can just take the pawn right back, right? And uh, okay, if something like castling, I could take play rook over to d8, right? Uh, you know, and, and white, white here, you know, just just after you know a few moves that uh, aren't even you know necessarily that bad or look that bad. I mean, even a one little slip up here, like rook takes c5, I take back with the queen, the rooks attacked, the knights attacked twice. This bishop is looking directly at the queen. White is in big trouble, right? So, uh, you know, I, I play this move d4. My recommendation to you guys is that, you know, th there are some time controls in chess, tournament chess, where, you know, you can sit there and really figure everything out and figure out if something works. But at the end of the day, when I played this move of c5, I was going, if I don't play c5, I, I know I'm going to lose this game. I, I know I will, right? I mean, if, if I just play passively here, I, I didn't feel very good about it. Okay, now apparently knight f5 somehow works here. Um, I still don't really get it because white can just totally damage our pawn structure like crazy. 
of course, stockfish can make a lot of things work that us people can't. Uh, but I was, but I was really thinking, I mean, if, if I don't make something happen now, white does have a space advantage, right? They're going to get more comfortable, get more attacking play. And I'm just going to be in one of those positions where I'm kind of just moving around back and forth. So I, so I said, okay, I got to play active here and I got to make something happen in the game. None of these moves were played by Carl. We instead see the move of Bishop D2, right? W running away with the Bishop, but not losing this pawn on F4. Okay. I continue now. By playing knight d5, I'm now just trying to double up on this pawn. We do see castling kingside. I take it. Uh, the rook runs away. I throw in a check. I castle. This is all pretty, you know, pretty basic moves. Um, bishop c4. I, I play king g7 here. Basically, I'm just trying to get out of this line of fire. Um, and notice as well that if I just make some kind of silly little move here, queen takes g6 happens. I can't take because my pawn is pinned. So I'm getting my king out of the pin. And I'm just kind of supporting my, my general structure, my general area. We have queen d3, and uh, white here is actually threatening to take on e3. Whole idea being that if I take, I lose my queen. But I find this move of rook takes e5, right? Carl responds with rook takes e3. And uh, again, I mean, if I take on e3, I just lose my queen, right? So that's not any good, okay? But instead, I just take the bishop. Whole idea being here is it's kind of weird. I'm not even threatening to win the rook on e3, right? Because again, it's pinned. But if you do take my rook, I take your rook, right? Which is what happened. And the game, and by the way, if this rook runs away somewhere, you know, let's say it goes back to e1 or something, I can just play rook c3 and I'm fine, right? So that was kind of my thinking here. At this point in the game, I am up one pawn in material. Carl takes. I take back the rook. We have queen c3. Um, and yeah, I can't I can't really continue holding on to this pawn uh, very well. So I just play queen e7. I capture off that knight. Uh, and I play rook b8. Solid move. I don't think that's a huge mistake or anything. Uh, although I will say this move of rook b4 is very iffy. Okay, now, uh, you know, honestly, at this point in the game, I have a dead draw. I have a dead draw. In fact, the computer has, you know, a, you know, a minus 0 0.3 advantage for black, which is not very much, but it's better than plus 0.3 for white, right? So, you know, I felt pretty comfortable. And I don't know how I came up with this, uh, but I was, I was thinking of this kind of crazy idea, like rook b4. Rook a4, rook a3, notice that rook a3 is defended by the queen. Boom, attacking that queen. My whole idea is that like, okay, I play rook a4, if f4, I play rook there. And then I play queen h4, right? I'm trying to think of how I can attack this king that is a little bit loose, a lot more loose than mine, arguably. But then I just face this move of, of f4, and I kind of realized that, that rook a4 just isn't going to get the job done. We're just too late, right? f5, if I attack the queen, I get forked with f6, right? So going back to f4, I play the move of queen e6. My whole idea is to, to defend the square of f5, of course. Right when I play queen e6, I realize that f5 is an option, okay? And I would say, you know, in bullet chess sometimes, or, or, or well, I mean, really bullet chess, you gotta do it every move, but blitz chess or anything like that, um, you know, right when they make a move, sometimes you see a move, you know, oh, if they play this, I'm gonna play that. That's what happened here, right when he played f4, I played queen e6. Um, I was trying to keep an advantage on the clock and just try to play fast. Right when I played it, I went, oh my gosh, F5 is still possible. It's still possible. Right, and we'll get into that in a moment. What I should have done here, I mean, you know, th there's multiple moves that the computer looks at. I love this move of Rook B5. I think this is just, you know, of course I just moved this Rook. What I should have done is play Rook B5 right away and Queen E6, this Queen on E6. Uh, you know, would cover a lot more squares. Of course, what I played in the game was just queen e6, but the difference is that there was not a rook on this square. The whole idea here is that if you play f5, I take with check on e5, and guess what? My queen's defended. So I'm just going to go up a pawn in a rook, rook and pawn in game, at the very least have a draw, right? Probably a draw against a player like Carl, but hey, you know, better be on the attacking side than the defending. And okay, if something like rook e2, I can now lift my queen. You know, f5 is covered, right? If you play f5, I take with the queen. a2 is attacked. Every single piece here, except for my king, is defended. And of course, you know, you don't need a, a piece directly defending your king because the king can never be captured. Um, so everything's feeling really solid here. All I have to say, f4 is played. I play queen e6. f5 is seen. There's no rook on b5, right? Huge difference. My, my queen and rook are not really matched up, right? They're not feeling a whole ton of, you know, unity or, or anything like that in terms of where they're wanting to go in this game. I was sitting here for a while. I end up taking on f5, and that was the end of me. 
okay f5 bad move i, I was i literally thought to myself the computer's probably not going to think that's a good move but i don't see any way for white to win well guess what there was a way for white to win what i should have played was just a move like queen b6 just offer a draw right just offer a draw okay uh you know if, if white wants to to play something like f6 i just tuck my king on h7 i'm fine They're, i'm fine i'm totally fine um you know if white plays something like queen f3 okay i play rook b2 right putting a ton of pressure on that rook the rook the rook can't just run away right to like f1 it's pinned to the king and uh, if you take my rook i take back uh, i'm looking to capture off this pawn on e5 and uh yeah i mean i mean black here with with an advantage in that case right so it's really after queen b6 what white should do uh you know it's just play a move like queen takes b6 or queen d2 anything else here and, and black does have a small advantage so queen b6 would have been the move there to seal the deal for a draw assuming that i didn't mess it up later on but of course against f5 i take i see a check i run my king over and i did not see this idea we have queen g3 threatening threatening mate in one and threatening mate in two right against my king i play queen g6 just blocking right queen c3 is played okay i defend my rook in my in my head i'm going okay if you play queen g3 i, I block if you play here I, I play queen b6 we might you know maybe i'm hanging on here queen c8 is played freaking queen c8 is played and i'm like i'm done queen g8 is on the way right and that that that's just not looking good for me no matter how you dice that one up queen h6 i just get mated on that turn um, and I'm just done. There's no way to get out of it. King h6. I can act like I can run away, but I can't. So I play queen g6. Queen d7 check is played. I play up and we have a fork and I just resign this position. I think overall I played a solid game. Uh, but honestly, once the middle game was reached, I still don't re regret this move. Bishop takes knight. I just wanted the knight off the board. At this point, I got to play more solid. Right? There's a couple ideas here. One of them is to just play queen e6 and, uh, you know, look to to drop this queen on f5 just get that solid position and like i said um you know going back if i just play rook b5 uh i'm totally chilling here right rook b5 and finally again another opportunity to get a draw against f5 if i just play queen b6 offer a trade of queens i just i i, I merely looked at this move and went oh gosh this looks scary it looks scary right uh you know they can open the position up and uh, because I thought it was scary, I opened the position up, right? What, what's the sense in that? If I'm scared that position is going to open up, why would it? Why would I just open it? So that that's something to think about. But but you know the move that I missed here. Um, well, there are multiple moves that I could play here, but I think Rook B2 is the most efficient, right? Very simple, right? Just freaking go after that Rook, and uh, yeah, we're we're totally fine. So all that to say, uh, usually the hippo crushes, but in this game, the hippo was crushed. Hey, thanks for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Wanted to give a big shout out to my Patreon supporters for the month of June in 2023. If you haven't checked out the Patreon before, uh, go make sure to check it out. We'd love to have you join the family and we are continuing to add more and more benefits um, that you get right by becoming a member. As always, thanks for watching today's video and I hope to see you in the next one.